Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer Madrill, and today is Tuesday, July 18th, 2017. And this is just an open house for our mobile learning design sprint. We will probably have people hopefully popping in and out during the, uh, the course of the next hour or however long we decide to chat. Um, right now, we've got two participants plus myself, so <laughs> be kind of a quiet conversation for a while. Um, but I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank everybody for joining. I just want to give you a quick update on the course. We had hoped to get maybe 50 to 70 people to sign up. And as of today, we have 133 who signed up. And as everyone knows who has signed up, this is also considered a fundraiser for our organization. So that 20, so well now we're at 26, what is that, $2,666, I guess it would be, is, um, is very valuable. Um, for example, um, we have to buy um, insurance for our board, and um, we also have ins other types of insurance that we need to buy for the nonprofit, which happens to be $2,500. So if you want to think about it in those terms, this class has effectively funded um, the insurance for an entire year for the nonprofit. So thank you all very, very much for that. Um, and then with that, um, let's just hop in real quick um, to what I wanted to share. Hopefully, um, Jeff and Monica, can you guys see um, the, my screen? Okay, great on the text chat. So what, I'm, what I've got pulled up right now is OER Commons. And so when you go through the course, um, the design sprint, what you'll see is what we're asking folks to do is take a look at some of the open educational resources that have been created in our prior courses, our prior massive open online courses that are um, uh, facilitated on Canvas Network. And we've had hundreds and hundreds, actually 3,500 um, people who've signed up for the MOOCs and um, we were approaching, I think, 86 or something like that, um, resources that have been completely designed and developed and posted up on OER Commons. So those are, they are finalized. But for the most part, the audience, the intended audience for those are face-to-face -face classrooms for adult education. And so we decided this with this idea of the design sprint. Um, let's try to figure out a way to leverage the technologies that our adult learners have in their pockets um, probably most likely that being a smartphone and figuring out ways that we can take components of these previously designed lessons and figure out ways to facilitate that on a mobile device using off-the-shelf applications. So this is not a class about developing mobile applications, but rather using some type of uh, mobile application that already exists and use it within the context of, um, our, of the lesson that's been designed. And so the reason I have OER Commons pulled up, that's where we house the original lessons that you're using as the base. And then also, as, as is described within the design sprint, when you, once you've gone through the process of storyboarding and then turning into a prototype and testing with users, and then um, you'll take the, that original lesson and remix it, which is effectively copying it and making a new version, making your edits, and then when you turn that in as your final assignment within the design sprint, we'll go ahead and put that back up on OER Commons as a remixed or a new resource. And so this idea of um, storing all of our resources on OER Commons, if you're not familiar with it, it's a great platform to both find resources as well as develop, to develop resources that you would wanna share with others. And so our idea is we don't really consider anything that we complete within our courses to be final, perfect, polished, um, it really is this whole idea of developmental evaluation, where we hope over time through crowdsourcing, people will come on, see these resources, feel compelled to either use them in their classroom or uh, hopefully um, adapt them and, and take them to a new direction that we hadn't uh, contemplated based on the context and the learners that they're working with. Um, so with that fairly long preamble, I'm gonna go ahead and, and show you here. Um, this is Anna Anglin who created this resource. And she um, has been a, a volunteer or a student volunteer service learner, I believe on three, maybe even four of our projects. And so if, you go to, if I go to here to version history, you can see what she did. She took an, a resource that was originally created by Pamela Wright um, called Gaining Technical Literacy by Using a Range of Strategies. So let's go ahead. Hopefully I won't get myself down a rabbit hole here that I can't um, get out. But here is... The, um, and again, in the text chat, if you guys can tell me if you can't see anything I'm pulling up or if it looks goofy on your end, I'll, I'll try to work on that. So she, um, she created this resource. Pamela Wright created the resource with the subject being Career and Technical Education in English. Um, it, it was written for English language. So in every resource in OER Commons, you'll see where the author has um, provided this descriptive information. 
Um, and again, this is the original base resource that, um, that Anna was building her resource off. And so you can see um, scrolling through the original resource. So what I'm gonna do now, hopefully I can find Anna's pretty easily here. Let's go back to Anna. So given we are in a course with the goal of designing um, mobile learning opportunities, Anna basically kept the, um, the, the flow of the, the lesson the same, um, the, the curricula, or I'm sorry, the uh, subject matter basically the same, how long it will take. But what she's done though is incorporated the use of Merriam-Webster Dictionary mobile app. And I think that's a really, a really great choice because for one, um, it's, it's a good app. It's not like some fly-by-night weird app that may, may not be available on everybody's um, device. But also, it's, it's not only teaching um, the purpose of this, this lesson, but what a great app to be able to just know how to use in general, regardless of whether you're, you know, once you're done with the course and you're not using it on this particular um, lesson, it's just a great tool to have in your toolkit as a person uh, to know how to use um, the, the app. And so if you go through her lesson, again, she's kept everything pretty similar as far as the warm up or the introduction. But when you get it, start getting into some of the, um, the practice opportunities and, um, and, and demonstrating how to look things up, that's where she's incorporated instructions on how to download the app. So let's click on this and see what it works. Again, hopefully crossing my fingers doing this live, this works. Um, so she has put, um, looks like she's got this as um, a Google Doc, or Google uh, presentation rather. And she's just showing the learners you know, how to find the app. And again, as I mentioned before, you may be looking at this going, well, this isn't what I, you know, this isn't what I envisioned as far as thinking about developing a mobile application. Um, it's absolutely fine at this, stage of what you're doing to not have a perfectly glossy, perfect presentation of what you're trying to do. The idea is just to get your designs out there into the world. And um, so this looks very much like my demonstration that I put together in the class. Um, and we also have to consider too who our audience is. Um, the audience being adult learners with low um, math and literacy skills. So she, she's incorporated within this a lot of pictures, and um, a lot of simple text that's off to the side. So this would basically be, it, it appears from what she's, I haven't, uh, haven't read it, I've kind of read it out of order here, but the idea being that um, the instructor would have this as either an online or a face-to-face -face handout to give to the face-to-face -to -face class. So this is what I would consider kind of getting more into like a blended opportunity. So I think the idea here is it's still working with learners in a face-to-face -face classroom, but you're figuring out ways to, to kind of bridge onto some um, online slash mobile learning tools, uh, which I think is a really great, you know, great way to, way to do this. Um, so I don't know, Jeff or Monica, did you have any questions about what she did or any thoughts about it? So we don't have to just listen to poor <laughs> Jennifer ramble on. I'm just curious, has this course actually been delivered? No. So you mean as far as the, the lesson plan? Is that what you mean? Correct. Yeah. So the idea being, um, you know, these are out there in the universe. We have no idea if anybody's actually taken it or tried it. Um, and just to kind of frame what we're hoping to do as, as we progress as an organization, we've um, started talking with some adult education programs. And our next phase will be now to try to start um, refining these so they could actually be given in a classroom and then test those. So to see how it works in the real world. But this one has not. In fact, I think Anna just turned this one in like a, maybe a week ago, three or four days ago. And you mentioned that the target audience is sort of lower level adult learners. Mm -hmm. um, what's the actual content? Is it... Yeah, so let's go. Let's let's look at her um, at her description here. So level okay, so grade level D, and um, don't test me exactly on this, but I believe that would be about a tenth grade reading level. Um, and so this is for um, a reading assignment, and then this is these are called the, um, that are written here. I don't know if you can see where it says the anchor one and the anchor two. These are standards that are like the Common Core standards for K-12, but they're adapted for an adult audience, so they're called the College and Career Readiness Standards. So this lesson, when it was originally created, the, the designer was focusing on um, creating um, a lesson that would focus on, and as it says right here, citing specific textual evidence to support analysis of science or technical um, texts, 
uh, and also determine the central ideas or conclusions of a test, a text providing an accurate summary of the text distinct from prior knowledge or opinions. So if you look at, and um, we have this within the course, the way that the uh, college and career readiness standards are laid out, and much like any type of educational standards you're looking at, based on grade level, things shift. So the standards, uh, the requirements become higher as you go up in the standards in terms of grade level. Um, and so this is a pretty high grade level. Um, you're, this is about where you're ready to take the GED and pass it if you're um, working at, a, at this grade level D. So um, she, the, the designer made an assumption of, um, of what would be the target audience for this. Um, and then let's see, if we start looking at the lesson. So learners will brainstorm about prior experiences they encountered with unfamiliar technical vocabulary. Um, there's an introduction, um, defining some technical terms, uh, telling them, oh, these are the objectives, sorry, define the technical terms, download the, uh, the app, and then create definitions and new step, uh, sentences from learned technical terms. Um, okay, so this one has a sample story for the introduction at the end. Um, let's look, pop over and look at that. And again, this is a probably, I'm guessing this part of the resource, is, resource was designed by the first designer. Um, and not Anna. So this is the story that they go through. Oh no, edit, yeah. So it looks like Anna did edit this one. She just edited it about uh, a couple weeks ago. And that's, I think, again, like I said, I'm so excited about using a platform like OER Commons is, is this whole idea of kind of crowdsourcing. You build off of what, what's come before you. The original artifact still re resides out there. It, it's not like you're um, replacing it necessarily. It still resides there. You're, you're, you're modifying it. So then it looks like the instructor hands out a copy, um, dealt a devastating hand to the learners. So again, this is some type of handout. And it looks like Anna went in and made some revisions to that as well. Let's see, and then it looks like there's certain words from that um, handout that they want to start working on. So inflammation is a word. Um, I think that's one of the ones she's got that, that they look up within, if I remember correctly. Uh, let's see. So the instructor writes on the blackboard, any insights gained, for example, extreme pain, red swollen, and the war was taking place inside her joints. And then the students eventually get to the point that they look up the definition of an inflammation. And then they also kind of continue this on through in a, in a guided practice opportunity. So what we try to do within the lesson plans is also go through this, I hate to call it like a template, but basically we do try to get all of our lessons to have this idea of a, a warm up or an introduction that leads into some type of demonstration, guided practice, and then some type of um, evaluation or assessment uh, that goes into how they could apply this in the, in the real world. Uh, so any, you want me to look at anything in, protect, in, in particular, Jeff or Monica? Do you want me to drill down on anything? The focus is on using, or the, for this sprint, is kind of the mobile aspect of the course, right? So you mentioned the Merriam-Webster app. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are there any other mobile components of either this particular course or in general that it's getting used? Yeah, she just picked one. And um, when, when you get into the design sprint, we purposely ask you to really con concentrate on something that would take the learner about 15 minutes. And that being because we want you to be able to finish the design sprint in about 20 hours. And if you start creating like a really long mobile learning activity, your time is going to stretch well beyond that 20, uh, that 15 minute target. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially when you consider not only are you storyboarding, you're pro prototyping the materials, you're also, we're asking you within the design sprint to practice um, usability testing. So um, we, we ask you to try, try to find at least three friendly faces that will try to go through this section of the lesson. So she, that's what she would have had, um, had her, her people, her users go, um, excuse me, go through and test. Um, but yeah, so what do, you, what do you think, Jeff? I don't know, I, neither of us are particularly familiar with this lesson, but um, where, do, where do you think there, she could also, you could also then, maybe you could pick this one up, for example, well, and like I, take I, it to a new level. You know, what do you think? I see for, Mark, Mark has joined us, and I was uh, checking out his uh, work shortly before we started and noticed he's working on open words, which oh, is very, very cool. app-driven. I'm wondering if he has any thoughts to share. 
Definitely. Hi, Mark. I didn't see Mark Mara. Did I join us? That's great. Yeah, Mark, if you've got your audio handle handy, feel free to, to fire it up. Yeah, Monica. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, hey. hi uh, Jennifer, Jeff. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I got the wrong time on the meeting. I, I'm, I hate to cut in uh, halfway through, but I'm also happy to share anything about open words if you, if you guys have any questions about it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's great. We're, no, this is just an open house, so come and go as you're, as you're able. We got people calling in from, I think Monica just uh, typed she was at work. So, yeah, so, okay, so you're, are you in the course or is it one of your students in our course? This is like a back channel I got, I think, got an email, right? Yeah, that's right. Roy uh, Gung Niu, uh, Roy Niu is in your class. Okay. Um, I am not, uh, so I'm, I'm learning, I'm hearing a lot about you guys, uh, what is open words? Um, open words is um, open source language learning web application. That's what we're building. Um, so it is language general. Um, and I, I think to, to describe it really quickly, um, you could describe it. It's sort of like uh, Duolingo, but all open source. Um, so, uh, so people can control, uh, instructors can control what are the contents of the lessons. So think, think, um, conjugation, s simple sentence construction, vocabulary, hearing audio, some basic functionality like that. Um, and, but also with freedom and with an intellectual property model that conforms better and aligns better with the values of higher education. Um, so, so instructors can build lessons and then uh, follow their students' performance outside of the classroom. And it's not really intended to um, replace classrooms, but um, provide some uh, uh, provides, you know, provides some uh, mobile capability outside of the classroom to basically assist. So I think that's a really quick description. I, Is there a chance that you and I were in Kurt Bonk? Did Kurt Bonk invite you to talk to his class once about maybe 18 months ago or so? Yes. I think you and I yes. were at the same time. Okay. I was like, this sounds really familiar. Yeah. So you were yes. just really starting out at that point, I think, right? That's correct. And um, in the we, we, we've been, uh, we're working relatively slowly because we don't have traditional investment. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we, so, but in the last couple of months, we've had a, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of um, um, successes. Uh, our web application, the core technology is um, being finished at the moment. We, we've, uh, we've added some of the core features like audio, um, and uh, I think we're pretty close to, to a, a core web app. And then we had a successful Indiegogo campaign, which and all of that money from the Indiegogo campaign is going to not the core app development, but the content. So if you can imagine, like imagine the Wikipedia, um, you could have the technology of the Wikipedia done um, but not have a single page um, of content. So you need, you know, like United States, uh, what else might you want a Wikipedia article about? Um, roses, uh, et cetera. And so we had that successful Indiegogo campaign. Now people are building, um, at the moment, Mandarin to uh, English and English to Mandarin. In fact, that's, that's Roy um, who's okay. doing that. Okay. And so yeah. when you say you have people building, are they, is it much like we're doing on designers for learning where it's crowdsourced volunteers like students or these designers that you're paying or how, how, do, how are you doing that model of the content creation? And well, um, it's, it is largely volunteer. Um, it, although except, except no, I guess it isn't really volunteer. Um, I think it would be volunteer, but I also want to pay them. And yeah. so we raised, we raised money um you know to allow uh people like roy um 
to justify putting a, a fair amount of their time into it. So I really want to adopt the kind of the values of, uh, of pooling efforts and, and uh, you know, that comes from open source. Um, but at the same time, I want to, uh, with open words where we are attaching revenue models to the to the enterprise right. and the purpose That's really the is to then, right <laughs> it's like yeah I, we're, we're kind of the in the same, same boat you know we, we've had um, so much volunteer help to this point it does kind of make things a little trickier when you start introducing even grants or you know where does that money flow yeah but go ahead sorry we're, sure sure but I've actually come up with some things you know it's really tricky when you bring in money to the equation because it can um, crowd out some of the uh, the psychological um, impulses towards volunteerism and uh, community contribution. It actually it can it can interfere with that. But um, um, but we've come up with revenue models not implemented yet. But we've come up with revenue models that would provide that would collect money what, from what, appropriate What's the plan? Parties. Can you give us some details? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the plan basically. Mark, yeah, by the way, I don't know if you can tell if, if there's something you want to share, if that would make any of this easier, um, hopefully you should have a screen share button. If that's something that you want to do, feel free to take over the, the screen if you want. Oh, sure. I mean, I would recommend going to uh, our website. I, I, we have recently uh, put the code um, on online and I, I can share that link in, in a little bit. Um, yeah, let me see if I can give, you know, we don't have the link to the GitHub page at the moment. So let me, let me share that with all of you. Uh, GitHub. Um, there's a, to express problems, there's a, open words has a markup language. Um, so the, the way, the way you express a problem is with a, a certain code, um, basically a text file that the web app reads and, uh, um, you know, sort of like bib text uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, we, we've begun uh, writing the reference for that markup language, and that is also has some screenshots. I can share that right now if I can figure out how um, Zoom works. Um, oh, sure. I think Jeff's in the, yeah, Jeff was just taking us through a couple shots. So uh, along the bottom, at least that's how mine looks, um, it's just a, a green box with an arrow, up arrow, and you can click share screen. Um, share. Uh, and I don't want to let you off the hook that easily to uh, in answering the, uh, the sustainability model. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff's been working on sustainability <laughs> models for many, many, many years. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, sorry, I got distracted there. Um, but let me, <laughs> let me share these. Yes. These are some yeah, of the screenshots. Um, uh, like I said, Roy is working on that right now. I, you know, here's I am a cat. Uh, here, this example one is I am a cat, um, and it has the Chinese, and it's basically a recognition problem slash construct problem. English to Chinese, it isn't super hard because they're both um, uh, SVO languages. Um, uh, and then uh, here is a recall. Problem. That's subject, and then, verb, object for non-language teachers. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's right. And and so um, and this is the code for representing, you know, this this problem. Um, and you know, now let, so I'll scroll through that. I'll I'll try to share this particular link here, which is a link to our GitHub page where all the code for the uh, web app is available. Um, but I want to answer. Um, want to answer? Uh, was it? Is it Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, answer Jeff's question. Um, uh, so basically, op think about Wikipedia for a second. Um, Wikipedia is free and open source, uh, but the usage of Wikipedia uh, not only it's not free and open source it's also shouldn't be. So imagine like um, somebody is writing an article on a sensitive topic in, in a country where they, where they wouldn't be allowed to write that article. It's a little bit of a, an emotionally sensitive, politically sensitive example, but it's a real example, right? So you wouldn't write, 
you wouldn't want um, Wikipedia, wouldn't want to share information about who's reading or writing articles about apostasy in certain countries, for example. So that's usage data. Um, in fact, Wikipedia doesn't even collect that. Um, and so their usage data shouldn't, it's really not, shouldn't be open source. It's really more of a private kind of thing. And so Wikipedia behaves in that way and actually open words will behave in that way as well. Um, but it is a place where we can implement um, a revenue model um, because what we can do is in the case of learning, there are appropriate people, professionals and appropriate institutions to view usage data. And those people are teachers, instructors, and those institutions are uh, universities. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the app open source. Um, we're going to make the usage completely free. Um, but if you want to, if you are a university and you have a large endowment and you want um, your instructors to be able to follow the performance of their students, which is really sensitive data, right? So some students, I think one of the main differences between students would just be, you know, speed of learning, you know, how, you know, um, to, to some degree based on, you know, aptitude and things like that. And of course, that's very sensitive information and it shouldn't be public. So what we'll ask universities to do is to pay us for um, the ability to get simple analytics of their students to their instructors. And I really, this model was given to us basically directly from Creative Commons. Um, we, were, we participated in something called the Open Business Model Canvas, which was basically an exercise where people um, tried to develop um, business models that would support open source pro projects. And um, they basically handed, the, handed this to us. And I personally found it very attractive as a, as a possible model for, our, um, for sustaining and growing open words because it uh, accomplishes a few things. It looks at data that shouldn't be public and it places a wall on that, which is a good thing. Um, and it allows us to um, request money from institutions that can pay. And if there's an institution in the world that can't pay, it's, you know, like let's say a university in a country that doesn't have a, doesn't support their universities very well and maybe doesn't have, they don't have great educational technology bud budgets. In those cases, we can give that information out for free. So there's no denial of access to information, um, but it also allows us to, um, allow those institutions with endowments and with resources to effectively subsidize those that, that don't have that. And, and so, so within, yeah. the, within the app, these are everything we've looked at looks like practice opportunities as then the part of the catch then too, is there any type of assessment or you can you tell like level where people are? Is that or is that not something necessarily that, that open words would do? Well, that's what we in order to implement our revenue model that, that I described, we need to have that assessment there. And so that would be a separate web. So there's one, ser one server that collects information about performance of uh, students. And then you could, we will, we're actually, we are currently being, we are currently building the um, access point to that server, which is a, a website, not for the students, but for the teachers to uh, instructors to view the performance of their students. You know, the mobile device um, technology, as you guys are really well aware, given that you're, you know, you're studying mobile learning, um, really, it's an amazing, the technology is really quite amazing. You know, you, 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 you could um, collect all of the data from every single performance of every single learner distributed globally um, and even if there were a hundred million people doing it, um, you could collect all of that information indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, a, it's an enormous t capability. It, it, you know, the, the way I sometimes jokingly refer to it for, for people is 
all of that <laughs> spy technology that people have with these devices could be leveraged for instructors. And that's, that's effectively <laughs> what we want to do. Um, and, and so we are building that access point. Um, and it starts with really simple information like, I think that the, the most important information will be the most basic, like did, they, did the student do it? Did the students finish the lessons? Um, and then secondly, uh, maybe aggregate data about what particular problems uh, were really hard, maybe by some metric like the percentage of students that got it wrong on the first try. So really simple information, but powerful because you are not grading it. It's being collected for you automatically. And um, yeah, it's being collected automatically. Um, so what we hear from um, adult educators a lot is um, you know, the, the adult education programs, let's say, let's use a hypothetical there, they receive a grant. They need to show progress of their learners in order to continue receiving funding and to meet the requirements of, uh, of the grant. So I would envision something like this, and they're always asking for practice opportunities. Um, and rightly or wrongly, most adult education programs still are face-to-face, -face, um, um, even though they're trying to incorporate more online and, um, and mobile learning. A lot of it is financial, obviously. Um, and just even people being able to, um, learners having access to the, if you wanted to get, go real high tech with an online learning, um, they may not even have access to it at home, let alone even the center may not have um, co computer technology sufficient to do some of the more fun, <laughs> crazy bells and whistles things that we all love dreaming about. But something like um, Open Words or, or, or a, a tool like Open Words would be something where I could envision an, an adult educator could send people home with some homework saying, oh, you know, until we meet next time, can you spend, try to spend half an hour on open words on these assignments? And then they would be able to, um, I would think over time, you should be able to track the progress. Are they able to, um, whatever it is that your, your lesson is on, are, they able, are you able to see progress? So is that something that you would envision it, this being very much as a practice opportunity for students to, to use? Because um, it doesn't appear here there's like any necessarily instruction embedded in it, right? Where you'd have demonstrations or things like that. It, it's mainly for the, for the practice opportunity. Well, we will, discover, we will discover how it is best used. We have some ideas about how it could be, it could be best used. I, I would agree with you. It seems to be pretty good from, from the feedback that we've gotten from people like Roy and, and others, very good for immediate level problems, uh, for sure, like sentence construction and things like that, and also for practice. But the reality is um, we've also designed the, the language problems to be so flexible that, so for example, you know, the problem uh, is a conjugation problem, but it also could just be a slide in what you're going to do in the next 10 problems. Um, and it wouldn't be a problem so much as just an exercise. It could be in any language. It could be in the native language instructing. It's 10 um, uh, just, you know, just listen. And then here's another problem which just links an audio file. Okay. So it can be, it can be to, to some, and I actually working with Roy, um, we, we started out with problems like, like this one, um, like a simple conjugation problem or a sentence problem. And with the problem expression lines that we have, actually the, the types of problems or exercises that can be done have been ended upon. So, so, but, so I would say, yes, I agree with what you just said, but with the caveat that there's, a li there's more creativity about what can be done even with our own uh, problem expression language than, than we have conceived of uh, as of yet. Um, in terms of your other question, um, uh, adult education and some uh, kind of recording of information for evaluation uh, to receive more grant funding and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. And, I, and honestly, I hadn't really thought about it too much, but it's, um, if there is an institution that's doing teaching uh, and they need to demonstrate the results, this is absolutely... Um, possible to do. Uh, I had 
previously considered um, the teacher as the consumer, if you will, of the or the viewer of the performance data, but it absolutely could be reported further down or further, sorry, further up to other uh, institutions to demonstrate effectiveness. Yeah, we hear that a lot in adult ed because there are certain tests called like the TABE test and um, I'm trying to think of how there's another, I think TABE's the main one, there's another one where basically it gives you the level where the learner is at and that's really what they use then. Um, there aren't a lot of great opportunities for that interim while they're, while they're um, within your program to, to, be, to be able to tell where people are going. And we hear that a lot is questioning and asking for help on how we can help them to devise assessments. And it's just something we just haven't gone down that road yet. But we probably should for all the reasons I just said, because I think that really is an area where it's a hook, where that's the, where they need help. And, um, <laughs> you know, and we just started, you know, that just hasn't been where we've been spending our time. Um, we've been kind of more on the okay. instructional side of things, you know. But then okay. I think the part is like the blending of the two, where you're, as you're saying, you're inherently collecting um, assessment activity based on their progress through the, through the different examples that you're throwing at them, right? That's, that's correct. Um, that's correct. Uh, so, um, yeah, that is, that could be blended. Um, I think actually in during the, uh, 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 open business model canvas, uh, open business model, uh, program with creative commons that I referenced earlier, they actually suggested that, um, um, micro accreditation was another uh, was another revenue model. Um, I didn't find that one quite as appealing because it was less obvious who would pay for that. Who would pay for that? Yeah, it was less obvious, and also actually, actually, it, it put more of the burden on people who can't pay. So I kind of view universities, especially ones with endowments, as totally appropriate and capable of paying. But my point in bringing that up is simply to say that definitely people have looked at the technology we're building and considered um, this is a this there's the possibility of accreditation uh, certificates is there um, since the technology is open source and more than that uh, flexible meaning that people can author content. Um, someone who wanted to author a kind of test as opposed to an exercise could do that. And our purpose is also to collect the performance data that would allow to calculate a, a test. Um, but I really like your notion of um, blending the two activities. Um, I think that is more yeah, attractive and to I me. I think it depends yeah. then too on who your, you know, your audience is that you're developing. Um, and Jeff, I don't know if you're still um, up to, to chat, but I mean, you kind of do this, don't you, Jeff? Like, are you? Are yeah, you, I mean, I'm, 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 in, I'm in this space. I'm in, in language learning and using technology to that end. And, you know, I work at a university of foreign studies that would be a potential uh, customer, I think, for open words. And I think the things they're going to be interested in, they're going to want to see a fairly fully developed curriculum that matches their or, or, or uh, supplements what they're doing. Uh, they're going to want to see proof of uh, usefulness. They're going to want to see uh, results. Like the progress that we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. From one. Um, so yeah. Jeff, where so, you're at, like, I, I don't know how, how it works in, in language learning, but how do you, are there standards or what, what do you do as an instructor or those like assessment models? What are they based off of just to, to track progress? Yeah, but my institution is pretty uh, flexible in that. I mean, we have certain texts for certain courses and, and certain curriculum goals, but it's largely up to us to figure out how to implement that. Like I said, sometimes there's required text, sometimes there's not. I usually go rogue and <laughs> yeah. use a lot of technology. And, and as Mark was talking, I mean, there's a lot of technology that sort of accomplishes, you know, parts of, of what I think Mark is working on with open words. Um, Schoology is something where you have kind of a whole, are you familiar with Schoology, Jen? No. Mm -mm. It's, it's almost like a, a nicer blackboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> you kind of create your own space in there and you can create quizzes and the assessment is all, uh, you know, 
trackable. Okay. Um, so that's useful. Quizzes. I, I've used quizzes a lot this past semester. It's uh, similar to Kahoot, uh, but it's uh, self-paced and you get great data on, um, I was taking a look at this earlier. Let me share my screen. Okay, so yeah, why don't you share your screen and... Uh... Gosh, we're getting like an ed tech weekly going right here. Huh? Yeah. And I also want to say, I, I have questions for Mark and everything, but please stop us if you have other. Uh, no, this is great. Well, I did to want to, as you're pulling this up, Mark, um, and, and if, if along the way, whether it's here or we, we do it offline back channeling, um, clearly what our, what we, our mission is, is to bring instructional designers for, in particular, um, uh, instructional design students who are in graduate programs. who are trying to build a portfolio. And um, we very much bill the work that they're doing as service learning. You know, we try to give them something in return. As you said, maybe it's not necessarily financial compensation, but maybe it's, you know, access to real world problems and access to um, tools and technologies that they maybe were not used to. And so from that standpoint, if there would be some, something that our students could um, develop on your platform as a project, you know, that would be something down the road that would be great to figure out some way that we what we've done in the past is like basically design, develop like a design guide for what it is very specific. So what, what it is, what it is that you're looking for that our students would then um, develop as part of their project. Um, so to, to address that um, right now uh, we are moving relatively quickly. Um, and uh, um, so for example, Roy right now is, is building uh, lessons uh, for an instructor at Indiana University, and um, she wants to implement that in the next uh, couple weeks. I don't know if we'll make it quite then, but we're but we're close, and so we certainly will be testing um, and demonstrating that um, uh, utility in the classroom. So we're our aim right now is to get uh, a course um, for uh, to work alongside a classroom collect the kind of data that um, uh, demonstrates utility for the instructor and for the classroom. Um, and then if we're able to do that, then, then we can uh, potentially count on Indiana University as our first client. They've sort of given us the, the um, criteria required to, to uh, purchase an educational technology uh, subscription to the performance uh, data. Um, and so then in each, um, uh, so, that, so the short answer is yes, we're, we're prepared um, to begin working with other groups of people that want to develop curricula for their own priorities for their own institutions, whether that's other universities, other languages for adult education, uh, for college level, um, and then to tell you where the money is going to go, um, you know, if we develop funds, let's say through Indiana University, we will, we will be funneling back basically 100% of that into stipends for this curricula development. Um, we may also, um, for some institutions, we may also um, essentially hire out people like Roy to help them build the curricula they require. Um, so uh, we're gonna be looking for people who have that extrinsic motivation and then quietly um, provide them a stipend as a source of appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, and so absolutely the people that you're uh, talking about, we, we would love to work with them. Yeah, it'll just keep us, you know, we'll, we have lots of these feeler conversations going on all the time. Uh, that's usually how our projects then kick off. So, sorry, Jeff. Okay, I want to see your demo. Do you, can you do your demo? So I've got, uh, I wrote down school hours. If you have to go, by the way, if anybody has to go, let me know. I don't want to hold anybody back. No, it's uh, 1240 here, but uh, I'm on vacation. <laughs> I don't uh, think I've seen, you mean 1240, like in the next AM, yes. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that in a very long time, though. Yeah. Uh, so this is Schoology. It's kind of a, a full, uh, full-figured uh, course thing. So you've got uh, kind of like a, a Blackboard or a Moodle where you've got every kind of uh, thing you'd want. You can add tests and assignments and okay. things like that. Uh, there's lots of um, 
uh, data that you can get from about students. I haven't actually used it that much, but you can get, um, you know, how so-and-so student is doing this for just like a really quick, easy, uh, thing to use in a classroom quizzes is great. You can create your own, uh, quiz, um, uh, or, or there's millions out there that you can just kind of, so I was teaching the difference between so, such, to, and enough. Okay. So you just kind of create your basic quizzes. And then for the reports, you can go and see, okay, so 17 people took this. They had a 61% uh, success rate. I can go question by question and see how many got it right, how many got it wrong. I can see each student, what they answered. So it's been really useful for me to kind of get a sense for, okay, I just taught this. And when I said, okay, do you understand? Everyone said yes, but apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so just for, for both of these, for Schoology and then quizzes, are these um, free to use or are there different price plans or did you get Oh, these? Jennifer, you know the way I roll. If it's not free, I'm not using it. I know, but um, I didn't know if maybe your university was like. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're free. Quizzes is very similar to something called Kahoot. Um, but Kahoot, when you do it, the whole class has to do it simultaneously. Quizzes, you can do that or you can give them an assignment mode, homework mode. And so they just, you can set a time limit and they have to complete it. Um, while I'm screen sharing, um, uh, you guys had mentioned Padlet before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which do you use Padlet? I have. I use, actually, my screen share, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. The thing I, I've, I've used Padlet for a while. The thing I really like is they just instituted a shelf. So when you create a, um, a Padlet, there's, you can do a wall or a canvas and it's kind of different structure. Mm -hmm. This has been really useful for, uh, okay, so these are uh, words that end in Y and they have to sort them into nouns, adjectives, and adverbs. Oh, okay. And so it's very app friendly. They can do it on the Padlet app or on the web. And as a group, they can kind of just, they have to sort it into the correct uh, category. Okay, got um, it. Okay, so you set so the columns nice. up and those are static, or um, those are uh, stable and then they can move the, the correct. other rows. Correct. That's right. Okay. And another similar tool I used is something called uh, Poplet, which is back in the EdTech Weekly days when we said, oh, there's a new brainstorming tool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we might have mentioned this. Um, it's very, you know, you don't have to log in or anything. You just kind of click and add your little uh, uh, thing to whatever section. So when you guys were mentioning that, I wanted to include those. That's great. I so how, that's, that's a great point. So uh, as you said, Padlet has the app. Do you know if any of these are, how user-friendly do you think some of these would be on a tablet or on a, a All of them. Uh, I, I used all of them totally mobile-friendly. The quizzes, um, you know, you have an extra 10 minutes in class and, uh, all right, here's your quizzes code, go. Ah, and very good. then at the end of the class, I'd say, okay, I can see who understood what. Oh, so you, so that like we were talking before, so this is something that you would incorporate at the end of your class is kind of a little check. How did we do? So you know what to right. It could be end of class. It could be homework. I also found it very useful for those kinds of assignments when half the class is done and half uh, not and still right. working on it here. Okay. You advance students here, something to keep you busy. And, so and they, happens, you know, we hear that they all just the go on their phone and they're totally, yeah. Yeah. We hear that a lot now in adult ed. They'll have um, so many, you, you're not, you don't all have, you know, I was saying before that grade D would be maybe a ninth or 10th grade level. You're certainly not guaranteed that as the teacher, when people walk in the door, you'll have all these ranges. And I could have envisioned something like this being great till everybody kind of catches up um, based on what you're teaching. And the nice thing is there's already, I don't know about millions, but there's hundreds of thousands of these out there. So if you're looking for chemistry, you've got all these different chemistry quizzes ready to go. You can use them or you can copy them to your account and then modify. That's awesome. This is like a mini, um, Mark, uh, Jeff and I did a webcast every Sunday night for like what, eight or nine years or maybe? Yeah, it was a while. <laughs> it was a while. <laughs> so it was called EdTech Weekly and we would do just what we just did. <laughs> we just, <laughs> at that point, I probably should have written a book or something. I kind of knew every, the lay of the land of, of everything. And as you can tell, that's kind of fading. If you're not doing it. Well, I, you know, I saw as you were talking about the course, one of the things you mentioned was that most teachers or uh curriculum designers don't have time to make their own app like Mark is doing. Yeah. So a lot of times they sort of need to find 
uh, apps that, that serve their needs. And I'm curious, Mark, as you were having this vision and putting it together, what tools kind of inspired you? What, uh, and I, I know most of them probably weren't open source the way you're trying to do it, but when you were looking at the functionality, what, uh, what inspired you? Either by how they did something or how they didn't do something. Yeah, I guess I was just going to say, to some to some extent, it had to do with what 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 wasn't there. Um, I, I uh, there were a couple, one group that inspired me was Anki. Um, I I really like Anki a lot, uh, open source, um, but limited to you know mostly flashcard. It's a, essentially a, a you know a flashcard. Um, and then Duolingo, I'm, I'm sorry, can, actually. Can, 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 can we get a spelling on that? Anki? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, A-N-K-I. Uh, and it means, oh, it means something in Japanese. What does that mean, Anki? Um, no, I, I don't remember what it means. But it's essentially a flashcard app. And um, I think I was um, also inspired to some extent by Duolingo. Um, but basically, there weren't... Um, there wasn't in the open source world. I was familiar. There's encyclopedia functionality. Uh, there, you know, I'm a geographer actually by training. Um, there's uh, geographical information software technology that's emerging, and I just didn't see that kind of uh, rich um, multimodal uh, language learning. Uh, software out there that could do, you know, a variety of things like listening, hearing, conjugation, um, in addition to just uh, vocabulary. Um, and so that just seeing the lay of the land technologically that open source is going to predominate for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and for a variety of reasons, I sort of saw that this was an empty space to some extent. And um, there were a lot of, there were actually a lot of uh, quiz technology as well, um, but it wasn't focused specifically on language learning. And I thought language learning, human languages are um, a nice um, compromise between specialization and uh, generalization because there are 7,000 languages, um, a couple hundred that are really big. Um, and so it's, they're pretty variable. Um, but they're also, they have a lot of common attributes, um, en enough to justify a technology that's specialized to that. And so it was mostly seeing some of the, actually, I guess I would say this as well, with a lot of the commercial uh, sort of, the, a lot of the closed source technology that I saw, I saw a lot of repeated patterns. And, you know, it's, it's always the case that uh, high tech, uh, uh, Silicon Valley stuff, uh, they, you know, part of their marketing campaign really is, we're super, super innovative. Um, but actually, I saw a lot of repeated patterns in some of the closed source technology that was out there. And that actually suggested to me a kind of stabilization in some of the needs. And that, that was, that's actually a perfect time to start building open source technology because some of the needs are sort of figured out. And so a lot, a lot of what Open Words now does is stuff that has existed in other applications, but um, really shouldn't be closed. Does, does that make any sense? Did, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll go with a yes. <laughs> I, I kind of went all, all around there. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, speaking of tech, did I write sorry, that right? School, C C H O O. That's the right one, right? Schoolology. Yes, correct. And then correct. what's the uh, the other one's got all those Z's in it? Does... <laughs> oh yeah, I'll put that in the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I, I they really should have bought it a better <laughs> name from somebody. They were on the URL. I, think. Yeah. I, I was. I wanted to ask you, Jen, how you're feeling about the technology you're using for this course between Zoom and what's the home for your. Uh... This, yeah, that was, um, well, Zoom's an easy choice. Um, in fact, uh, Mark, are, are you at Indiana 
I think most, I think most of their professors I've talked to are using Zoom. Um, that okay. was an easy choice. Um, for what we, we actually, Jeff, we spent a little bit of money. I think it's 99 bucks a year for a hundred seats. But as you know, that's pretty cheap if you get something from it. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, it's got the text chat, it's got screen sharing. If you want to spend a couple extra dollars, you can even save to the cloud, which I did when we did our 12 hour webcast a thon. So I didn't have to sit and worry about saving um, the recording to my desktop and remembering to do it. I just recorded the whole day to the cloud. Can um, it stream to the universe? It can't. And I, I've okay. yet to find something that does everything I just described and does the streaming to the universe. If you usually, if you stream to the universe, then the tech, you know, there's something that's missing. Like the text chat's not as right. good. The, you know, there's just like usually some, something that's well, not there. You could always just stream it to YouTube, you know, Absolutely. set up two monitors or something. Yeah. Absolutely. We, we've just never had a situation where you had over a hundred people that really wanted to, uh, and then it's usually pretty easy for, we've never had any complaints from people not being able to log on. And the, the bigger question is always like, where do you house your course? And so we use Canvas Network for the MOOC, which is great, very stable. It's, it is Canvas, it's their free, um, they, they do it as, a, as their kind of charity mission, I guess. We were kind of uh, fall into that definition. So nonprofits as well as universities can use Canvas Network. Um, you could like you can't just go use it. You have to like go through an application process um, And again, you have to be a 501c3 or a university to be able to do courses on canvas network And then that's great because it's stable. They do all the back end. That was like a no-brainer We had thousands of people in the course But then when it came time to doing this design sprint In fact, I wrote to canvas and they will allow you to charge for classes But they take a cut and by the time we're only charging 20 bucks. It was like it's not really worth it um, so we looked at a whole bunch of different options and I'm okay with You kind of have to almost think in your head um, What do I need to change to be able to accommodate the tool I'm using when you start using some of the tools like we're with um, we're using this is um, Thinkific for example, the discussion board features are pretty much non-existent They have a discussion, but it goes across the all classes, which is ridiculous to me so, you know, if you have, if you enable the discussion feature and you have three classes, it's not specific to the class, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, and then you can, on an individual page, include, discuss, um, you know, the, dis, is it discussed, D-I-S-Q-U-S or whatever that is, you know, the old time thing you can put on your website, which I think is kind of horrible. Um, but then what I like about it, it's great for content creation from my standpoint. It's just WYSIWYG editor. You can go flip it over to HTML to embed some things. Um, obviously, you can collect money, which is nice. Um, and they do that seamlessly. We've had no issues with people having their payments get messed up or anything like that. But I don't know. Have you played around with it enough as a participant to know if it's been a pain in the neck? or? Um, I've been a bit of a slacker, which is another thing I want to ask you about a slack. Um, I, but I've, I've used the, the think ific to mm -hmm. kind of, I've navigated the first chapter and it's, it's okay. I mean, it, actually it's, it's fine. I, I was going to complain about like the front page, but really you can customize that any way you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's getting better actually. Even since I developed the class, they've come out with a new front page, like it can be prettier and you can put, you know, move stuff around easier. Um, but it, it's a kind of the age old, like, how do you run an online class? If it's, um, somehow you have to display content, somehow there has to be learner to learner interaction. If you're doing something like we're doing where we're charging, you have to make sure that's a fairly stable back end. Um, and there are a lot of them out there. There's a thing, um, teachable, um, is another one that we looked at. If you Google like alternatives to Thinkific, you'll get a page of, of right. options and they're all about the same. And so I'm sorry, I, do you have to pay for this? Um, yeah, I think my, well, again, you can do free, uh, free with, but then I wouldn't be able to charge. Like, so if you don't want to charge, you can do free. Fair enough. Um, and then as soon as you start charging, you can, there are different payment, payment models. Uh, I think it's $49 a month is what we're paying. Plus I think they take, I think it's 5% of each, each enrollment, I think. It how's, is. how's this, like you mentioned 130 people are enrolled. Mm -hmm. How's it, like, is there a social space that I'm not, that I'm missing? Well, that's, again, <laughs> that's kind of a, my, back to my, there's no good discussion board. So if like, yeah. you take one of our MOOCs, we have a very robust discussion board going where each module has a, 
a thing, you know, where we share and compare. We've got um, like an ask a subject matter expert form, uh, the share resources form that does, is non-existent in Thinkific. So what we're asking people to do is move that over to our LinkedIn space. Our we have a Google Plus space, which is kind of a joke. That's a <laughs> it's kind of a, you just hear crickets in there, and then Facebook. Um, but we haven't really gotten a lot of traction with people doing that. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Like what we could. Um. That. Okay, there's the LinkedIn group. Um, I would, the, the, on the main page, like I want the hub. Like I want to go click on the, the, a page and say, okay, this is what's been going on. I haven't checked in in a few days. Oh, here's what's been posted on a LinkedIn group or That's whatever. That's a good idea. Okay. So like, like even the questions or comments, like moving that up to the top of the page, like this is where I'm going to, when I say, okay, what's up with the course? I guess I land on the front page of the Thinkific page, if that's mm -hmm. your main space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, and then they very much get you into this idea, like how have you progressed within the course, right? Yes. So, you, so you're not repeating stuff you've seen, but you don't necessarily land on like a... But a, I've, I've been shamed a couple of times. <laughs> What's that? So you, you haven't done anything this week, <laughs> Jeff. What's up? Oh, you're Still at 26%. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, so it's very much geared to, they kind of call it like for uh, online marketing, people who want to go sell their wares. Maybe you've written a book and you want to bundle it around, you bundle a class, a quote class around it. Um, and maybe you'll give people like a chapter of the book and then you, you know, it's more geared toward that than necessarily like you think of an LMS, like you were describing some of the features of zoology. How is it where like all of your social spaces are designers for learning mm -hmm. as opposed to sprint specific right how's that working it's mainly been broadcast like we yeah. really when we have the MOOCs going like i said that's where all the activity is so like the introductory posts on canvas network we will have no kidding 900 posts like people just go crazy on that so i'm really when, when, so once that's going, we don't try to push people necessarily out to other spaces because it's already kind of happening in the class. But that was my big challenge with this one is like without that being part of the platform, how do I do it? So I didn't start a face. So you're thinking, I think you're then we're pushing me down the path of should we have done like a Facebook group just for the class? Um, I wasn't pushing. I'm, I'm just curious, like, is that sort of a, a synergistic thing or is it... Um... Is the conversation diluted because we're seeing all this designers for learning stuff and I want to focus on right. I what, what, what I'm, I'm wondering about for the sprint is like, is there some kind of show and tell board? Because at some point we're supposed to be producing something, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, a couple different, and, and it is when you get farther down the road. Um, and again, it's hard to collaborate alone. So we only have one student who's actually <laughs> completed the class. But like Anna, um, it's on that Padlet she put her uh, artifacts. So it's a link out to her thing that I showed you when we started today. So it's, it's like as you progress. And I can't remember um, what was for the storyboard. Was that for the storyboard or the, when you get to, the, I think it's the prototype um, that she had there, that, she, you know, that, that I have it set up for that. Oh, and then I think also the other one you were asking, I think for the, at the stage of the, um, storyboard is Slack, and you were asking me about that. Oh, yeah. so, so I just put you on there. Did you get your invite today? Yes, I did, and I joined. And I, I hear Slack people talking about Slack on various podcasts, as that's their their space. But I've never really been part of a very active Slack, so well, I don't quite this, get it. This won't be the active one you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see this. I shouldn't probably have this. I'm gonna have to now shoot, and I'm gonna have to go black that out. Am I sharing my screen still? Yes. Yeah, okay, see someone's so email. I'm gonna have to blog this out in the recording because I gotta read. I um, I have used Slack, but it's uh not uh not been very active uh, as well. So I haven't gotten enough experience with it to to provide any insight. I I, I do have a question for Jennifer about okay. the uh the the class that you're teaching right now. Sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, and again, sorry if uh, I missed this and you just described it earlier in the conversation. Um, so the, w what is the overall uh, pr uh, purpose and uh, uh, direction of the class that, um, that you are teaching that, that Roy is in? Uh, is it a 
curricula design course? Uh, is it oriented towards an overview of mobile technology that's out there that can be used? Or is it um, maybe, are you focusing on things like um, even the things that aren't does in mobile technology right now that that still that still need to be designed um yeah are um, there any of those three things so i would say of the three things you said the first two for sure um in fact we really okay. um we, we've said to everybody don't worry this is not a, a development class certainly if you're into that and they want to take it to the next level that that third thing they could you know we don't ever tell anybody they can't do anything but so for the most part, the people who are interested in designers for learning in general are people who are about to graduate or, or have already graduated and are struggling to find work or maybe career changers. So maybe you're um, a K-12 teacher and you want to get into instructional design in the corporate setting, or maybe you're a facilitator and you want to do, you know, transition more into instructional design. So that tends to be the people who reach out to us and want to take our service learning classes. So uh, we, we consider our mission to have really two, two sides to it. One being giving people the opportunity to gain instructional design experience, so curriculum design experience. And then rather than having people create disposable projects that they just throw out, we've taken it that next step and tried to, um, and, and made pretty hard we pushed on this whole idea of adult basic education because it's such an underserved um, segment. We were thinking originally we'd be kind of like a match.com where we'd have a whole roster of nonprofits that would, have, that would have requests for proposals and then we'd match them up with designers. But what we pretty quickly realized is even though we have pretty strong designers, they're really not ready to take on a project in a project management role. So we, we really couldn't just directly pair up instruct, instructional designer A with nonprofit Z or whatever. You know, they, there needed to be some more mentorship and someone stepping in the role of project manager. And from a small, our, mainly it would be me trying to manage all of these projects. We decided then to aggregate all kind of like all of the main needs of, um, of the adult basic education community by polling. We went out and polled a whole bunch of adult ed, uh, basic education instructors, program managers, um, some people in the Department of Education and came up with the things that they said they needed. And um, most of them said we need lesson plans that a teacher could grab. Most of the time their teachers are, a lot of times their teachers are volunteers. So as I showed, and I think like you said, you, you missed the very part, beginning part, but um, what we create are these lesson plans that take an instructor from the moment the student comes in until they walk out the door um, with handouts and materials that they can use. And we align things to the college and career readiness standards. And so the students that are coming in, um, meaning our MOOC participants who are coming in to learn curriculum design, we give them a design guide saying, we'd like your lessons to look like this lesson guide, design guide. And as they're going through this, it, so the, the, the experience then the MOOC participants are joining is a service learning experience. So we spend the first if you look at our tradition, not our, not our course that we're designing necessarily this summer that we're talking about, but what we're going to be offering it again this fall is our design course. Um, we'll have the first two weeks where, uh, or modules rather of the course, talk about the learner and the context because it's very unfamiliar context and learner population for most designers. Um, it certainly was for me. So we spent a lot of time with our pool of, oh my gosh, I think it was like 30 or 40, almost 40 different subject matter experts who contributed to helping us understand our learners. And we have learner personas um, that describe adult, the adult learning population, a learner population that we're designing lessons for. for. Then we talk about the context, all the stuff we started to kind of, I peppered in in our conversation here today. These aren't classes like you're at a typical university where people sign up in September and they graduate in December. It's usually open enrollment. Um, they may come to half of the lessons. They may not have childcare, so they can't come every week or you know, whatever the issues may be. So we spend quite a bit of time um, covering those type of, what would you consider in a typical um, design class being kind of the analysis piece where you're getting to understand your learners in the context. Then we go through um, and the um, we have the designers create what are called learn we're calling anyway learner experience maps. So if you're creating let's say a 30 minute lesson, that whole idea again of what is that learner going to be doing for those 30 minutes? Like walk through it without really getting into the development of it, but more just kind of creating an outline for yourself for what you what it is. So you start out with your objectives, what 
um, standards are you aligning to, um, what practice opportunities are you including, what assess, um, assessment opportunities are you including. And then we get into just traditional development work. And when I say development, it's certainly nothing like you're talking about when they're not developing like an open world app. I'm talking about like developing a handout, developing, you know, whatever the, the resources and the materials might be. So creating some type of prototype of that. And then within the MOOC, we, as Jeff was saying in this class, he wishes there were more of, um, we um, have the opportunities for people to share and compare and critique each other's work. And then finally, it all culminates with once they've had the opportunity to get feedback from course participants as well as subject matter experts, then they turn that in as a final deliverable. And once they do that, then they get a certificate and a badge from us that they've completed the, the service learning course. And we very much gear it as a service learning course rather than an instructional design course because we are kind of making the assumption that you're not going to learn how to be an instructional designer necessarily in our class, but we're going to be giving you a practice opportunity that hopefully aligns pretty well with you know, what you learned in, in your college program. And that's what, when I say college, we, we really do, our participants, um, about 75% of them either have or are pursuing their master's degrees, and probably another 20% are pursuing PhDs. So it's a pretty, um, and that's out of hundreds and hundreds of people. So it is a pretty good group of, um, of people, but they're just really hungry and dying for um, opportunities to, to gain experience and practice. So that was a super long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it sounds, um, it sounds uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I, I, I'm really, I'll, I'll be asking uh, Roy about it um, more. Yeah, and then to um, your, um, your question, I'm going to try to make this a little bit shorter. So what we did this, yeah. this summer, as we know, a lot of people um, still want to, this is probably maybe actually a good time for people to be able to spend time practicing because they're maybe not in classes as they would be in normally in the spring and the, in the fall semesters. And so um, we created a shorter experience. We tried to design it so it takes people about 20 hours to complete. And um, if, I don't know if you've got, spent any time looking at his material or Jeff, if you have, we base this off of the, the Google Ventures have design sprints when they're rolling out a new product. And the idea is you just create a really short, you have a very short deliverable, a very short window on it. They actually spend one week face-to-face -face and then pound this out within Google Ventures. So I've tried to take that model and, and take it to an online setting where you'd spread it out over 20 hours, self-paced, take the time, all the time you want, but we still follow the five-phase model. So it's, it's, as I was saying, there's the uh, kind of the analysis piece, there's like an ideation piece where you're coming up with potential ideas, and that's where we're getting into what you were asking for your second part of the question. Um, we're, we're asking people to go out and find, like Jeff was just describing before, go out and find tools that are already out there that you could use to incorporate to make amendments to these lessons that had been previously designed that could, you could build in some type of mobile learning component. Then they storyboard, um, then they create a prototype, and then they use your test, and then that's the fifth fifth and final stage. And hopefully you can do all those things within 20 hours um, based on this like short bite lesson that your mobile learning lesson you're de developing. Okay, I think I understand well. Um, uh, uh, I just uh, want to make one, one comment about open words, uh, particularly uh, how, it, how it relates to your class and to some of the people that are taking your class. Um, I do want to say that just to give you an example of how the development process works, it's um, it's not. Uh, uh, I want to demystify it a little bit, make it. Um, it's it's not as uh, complicated, perhaps, as you would think. So, so for example, there are two, at least two big aspects to it. One is the core technology development, and that's what the um, the lead developer and a couple a couple of other developers are working on. Um, and that has, they have to respond to what the, uh, the instructors request. They have to respond to what the designers um, uh, say would be valuable for a classroom uh, and for students. But, um, but, uh, uh, but they're responsible for that. That has nothing, so Roy has nothing to do with, let's say that. Roy has an exemplar of, uh, of other uh, people interested in curricular design. Um, then there's the curricular development thing, which is uh, a lot um, on a technical level, a lot simpler. It has mm -hmm. the, 
we do have that open words markup language and it's really transparent, human readable, text-based. Um, uh, and it's, it's meant for um, people, it's, it's there so that people who wanted to automatically create content could do so. But it is also simple enough um, that how Roy is working at first was he, he got a pen and paper out and, and story, like you said, storyboarded mm -hmm. the problems that he wants. And mm -hmm. so uh, one of the instructors or the instructor that we're working with at IU is um, not storyboarding, but she has some existing curricula that is in a handout form that uh, could uh, be adapted to a mobile device with all of the, advantages that come with that technology inherently like the tracking ability and and stuff like and remote um um you know it's easier to do on the bus and things right. like that right right um but it really is uh want to emphasize that the curricula design i think is the most challenging part of open words and we definitely discovered that after our first round of user testing um uh but it is not the technically challenging part okay. so if mm -hmm. so if we had instructors really figuring out what let's say an adult learner requires in terms of length of the lesson the content the specific problems what they look like um what we it isn't the, we've discovered that the learning curve for even just typing out the problem in the text-based format is pretty low mm -hmm. um uh but even if that isn't achieved it, it isn't much of a problem for someone in our group to simply translate um into the tech into the code that the, right. the lesson reader can uh right. that the web app can read um, we good. are yeah oh sorry i was gonna say and that, that look, i don't know if you cut the first part so we put all of our lessons up on oer commons and we even had a class, um, it was a bonus challenge where we said, okay, take what we've designed here as a face-to-face -face course and figure out how to, to teach that as an online course. So I think it would be even um, pretty, quote, doable, is if I'm, the way you're I'm laying things out or you were laying things out, even if, like you said, the instructional designer laid out the curriculum that would be even in a handout, <laughs> and then it would be up to some, you know, to then some, they maybe not be the person to like mark it up to put it up on the thing, but even if it was all laid out and it could be used in a couple different contexts, one being a really low tech environment, which we sometimes see where it's, like I said, a handout um, all the way through to something that you'd include in open world, open words. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, 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 that all sounds very good. Um, I would certainly uh, like to chat with you guys yeah. more. Are you going? Are you going to have other um, uh, web meetings like this? Yeah, what we're going to do is starting this fall. Um, we're we're going to have our new. Um, well, first of all, we'll have another one in August, and then starting in the fall when we have our new MOOC, we usually get a like the last one we had was eight hundred people were in it, and so we'll probably have an open house every month for the next six months associated with that class. And so we could either meet like before or after or whatever, we could, you know, whatever, or you could just call me <laughs> separately and we could talk. Um, but maybe that's probably one of the best ways to try to figure out what we do is like to kind of immerse yourself in it. And that, like I said, that one will be kicking off in the fall. So September 25th, class kicks off and enrollment goes up next week on the 24th. And all enrollment up. And I, I think I would probably like to attend as well. And uh, I, I would like to connect with uh, you and Jeff. Um, uh, I'm, I'm saying all this because I think I, I actually do have to leave. I have yeah, to drive. Say, we usually try to keep it an hour. I wasn't very good at my uh, wrapping. We'll call this a post show, I guess, this last bit. But thank you for okay. giving us an overview. And we'll definitely... Um, you know, keep in mind that you're you're doing this and try to figure out because from what you're describing, I think it does have a, an application in the adult space, adult ed space for sure. Okay, great. That's good to hear. Thank, thanks a lot, everybody. I think I have to run at this yeah, point, um, but great. it was Thank nice chatting so with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good right. to connect, Mark. Bye bye. All right. Good. Good luck. Bye.